We are welcoming Kate Wofford back for the second part of a two-part series on um, the effects this worldwide pandemic are having on uh, the planet, is environmentally speaking. So uh, when we last talked to Mrs. Wofford on Tuesday, uh, she sort of went through a global snapshot of the great things that are happening across the globe as far as wildlife coming back um, and you know waterways being extremely clean and, and air pollution being down and we left thinking about ways that our families might have noticed ways where we could make um, personal changes and then I posited to our um, our faculty and students a challenge to find something that we might be able to do at the school level or at your business level to make a positive change. So I'll let Mrs. Wofford start and then um, see if anybody has anything to contribute. Take it away, Kate. I brought a, I brought a guest speaker with me this morning, Will, um, hopefully to contribute to this discussion. And Missy, I did not, I did not prepare a formal presentation for this. I thought this would be um, uh, the best way to um, run this would just be to open it up to ideas from people. I did, Will and I have been talking and jotted down a few possible ideas of things that Wakefield students and faculty and the institution can do and families like ours. Yeah. And so I don't know, you, let's, what do you think about how we could structure it? We could, we could, um, we could look at different environmental issues like air quality, climate change, water quality, biodiversity, and sort of brainstorm some ideas within those, um, or just open it up to ideas that people have. Will yeah. and I can get some of the ones that we've come up with. What do you think? I think that's a great idea. Does anybody um, have anything that they have given any thought to over the last couple of days? that they'd like to um, just share with one another or toss around, see if it's a reasonable, reasonable pursuit? Um, I know for me, one of the issues we see at our farms is uh, the distribution system for our food is pretty bad. So um, I think it's over in Martinsburg, there's a pretty big distribution center where like all the big stores like Martins and whatnot buy from them. And uh, whenever they aren't able to sell enough like bread and stuff, they have to throw it into the trash, even though it's perfectly fine. Uh, so um, we, at least at our farms, you know, we're pretty good about using up everything we have and stuff. And so one of the ways we're able to reduce our economic impact um, and environmental impact is uh, we, we're able to go and get big truckloads of the bread that would have otherwise be thrown out and put into like landfills and we're able to feed that to the animals. Yes. So I'm like fixing up a lot of our distribution uh, systems would be great. That's great, Mikey. Michael, what is what do you produce on your family's farm? Sorry, what did you say? What what do you grow? What do you produce? What and I'm interested to hear, this is a topic I'm very much interested in, actually through my work in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and I'm curious to hear how the markets have been disrupted for your family's farm and what do you grow or produce? So actually what's interesting, um, it's not so much about a market disruption, it's just that um, the distribution system at least in, in my observations of it has historically been pretty bad. Um, Cause I, so the farm that we get all of our bread from, um, you know, I, I work for Mr. Duvall, the owner of the giving tree um, over in Linden. And he's got a, he's got a little, um, pretty small farm. It's, he's got like, right now we have about 20 cows at that farm. We have around 30 or 40 chickens. We have about 30 goats. And then we have, I think about, less than 10 pigs um and um you know he's he's very smart about like he's also uh got his own little uh beer industry and stuff so he'll get beer beer grains um and we'll feed that to some of the animals 
and you know stuff that doesn't get sold in time for the produce stand will make into slop for the pigs but um you know going back even to last year when i started with him um you know he he told me like basically there there's this like mass distribution center where they had originally been told to just throw anything that had passed the sell by date into the garbage um and so you know the owner of it was smart enough to you know open that up to people like him where they come up and they'll pick up truckloads of it and we feed a, a good bit of that to the animals um and so they have pretty good diets as a result you know less heavy on things like uh corn which is actually hard for cows in particular to digest and so we're able to really like put a lot of the a lot of the things that um otherwise just would be causing like environmental harm like the plastics and stuff we're able to recycle and we're able to put in all the work and effort that was put into the bread back into like the food chain so awesome that's a, yeah that's a great example and um well, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but one of the major ways to reduce climate change emissions, interestingly, is to reduce food waste. So, um, I mean, potentially that's one idea for Wakefield students to consider is an initiative within the school to um, maybe calculate the food waste and calculate the carbon emissions associated with that food waste and then look for ways to reduce it. Michael, yeah. Interesting. Uh, sorry, what were you going to say? Well, I wanted to share an example, a local example of, um, of ways that groups are connecting with each other to um, both reduce food waste and meet the needs of um, folks who are so impacted by the coronavirus and are visiting food pantries. Um, one of the, you may have seen in the news um, that we, there are dairies that are dumping milk and that there are um, farms that raise animals that are not able to get their animals to the processing plants. And so they're just having to slaughter their animals without having them um, make it to market. And, um, here in the Piedmont, the Piedmont Environmental Council, which is based in Warrington, has worked with a local dairy in Southern Fauquier County for years on some of the environmental um, protections on their farm. So they've worked with them on um, fencing the cattle out of the streams and planting riparian buffers along the streams to improve clean water. Um, and they've worked with them on soil health practices, which help take some of the carbon out of the atmosphere and block up the carbon into the soil. So they have a great relationship with this farm family, which is a dairy. And the dairy produces milk in the little milk cartons for schools. And when schools closed this spring, um, they no longer had a market for those cartons of milk, so they were dumping the milk. And at the same time, the food pantry didn't have enough food to meet the need of the people that were coming. So the PATH Foundation worked together with the Piedmont Environmental Council and the food pantry to get a little bit of funding to this farmer to change the processing system so that they could process milk differently so that it could be used in the food pantry. And so now the milk that normally goes to schools is going to the food pantry and meeting the need. And that's, a, that's just a really, I think it's a wonderful example, but it's a small local example of um, our food distribution systems. And, um, and those have been rocked by the coronavirus. Um, and I can share in the chat um, a, a, a couple articles about that if folks are interested. But um, what seems to be becoming more clear is that it, within our food distribution system in this country, there's a set of producers that sell to um, institutions like restaurants uh, and schools, which are closed right now. And then another set of uh, food processing and distribution system, which sells to grocery stores and retail, which are slammed right now. And the reason that we see some shortages on the retail side and then we see some surpluses in food being destroyed and getting plowed back into the fields 
um, is that those distribution systems are like so efficient, right? We've like squeezed out every bit of inefficiency so they can't be nimble to change, um, to meet different markets and different needs in times like this. Yeah, and we, you know, one, one of the reasons why, like, I mean, I, I'm i really big on like the small, um, smaller farms and stuff, because for one thing, you know, you're better able to control your herd. You know, if you have any like diseases and stuff, you can control that a lot better. Um, you're able to give them more love and care, but also, you know, there's like a whole bunch of different things. Like um, you're able to like reduce your uh, environmental impact for so many reasons. Like, you know, for one thing, um, we see a bunch of like big dairy, uh, like actually the dairy industry in particular has been hit hard because, you know, we had in rap panic, there is um, like a world-class um, dairy, dairy farm. Um, family owns, you know, and when all these uh, large dairy farm um, companies have started, started producing these massive uh, dairy industries and stuff, you know, you had these small dairy farms closing down. Um, and so, you know, they aren't always able to get out uh, their milk to the right places and stuff in time. And so they're having to pour it out. Whereas the dairy farm I work at is actually um, one of the last surviving, um, you know, family run dairy farms in Virginia. Like we have only three dairy cows and, you know, one, one of them basically is producing all the milk we need. The other one we aren't giving out, um, any milk from because she just got off of in a, antibiotics. And so we're able to reinvest her milk into making things like compost, which we put into the garden and we're able to grow, um, a pretty sizable food plot, uh, that we use to feed a number of people in Rappahannock as well. And so it's like little things like that you're able to control and help ensure that like everything you're doing, even if you can't directly use it for yourself, it's somehow going to be re like turned around so that it can be a positive. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and on Tuesday, when we had a discussion, one of the points that I tried to make in my presentation, and we've been thinking about a lot in our family and in our work, is um, how in many ways we're all desperate to get back to normal. So we're desperate to get back to school. The boys are dying to get back to their sports and their friends. Um, I'm tired of Zoom meetings for work. I'm ready to have in-person meetings for work again. But then in, in many ways, this is our opportunity to get back to something that's better than normal. So we don't want to go back to where we were in, in parts of our lives and our systems that were not working well. And um, there was a question on Tuesday that was a really good one about Black Lives Matter and what's happening um, with policing and the unrest in our cities. And that's, I think, clear to everyone that that is an area where inequities have been made um, obvious from this pandemic and it's a place in our society where we need to get back to better than normal when this is over. And I think my goal to your point, I think food systems is, an, is another example where um, our food system has become very um, global and we've lost a lot of those local connections and the local resiliency in the food system and that's a way that that possibly when this is over we can get back to better than normal and have more local and resilient food networks and food systems and i think those are the points you're making about reducing waste and sort of being creative and nimble um because every farm is different of course every community is different yeah i mean i, I would love to start seeing things like that um mr duval and i were having a little conversation about like things we would just love to see. I mean, we, we personally think it's a little bit um, unrealistic for some of the stuff that um, we were talking about, we were hoping could see happen. happen. Um, but I mean, like, you know, we'd love to start seeing smaller farms pop up, you know, like with all the economic hardship that we're facing, you know, if you have smaller farms that can actually compete and don't have to um, deal with the large corporations that are mass producing all this food, um, like Smithfield, for example, um, 
you know, if you have things like that, you're not only able to have a bunch of small farms spread out across the U.S. that reduce travel times and help solve some of the problems that we're seeing with the distribution system. You know, you can pair up a farm with a school, for instance, and you can have just fresh, um, pretty, pretty well-made products being produced and you don't have to drive as far to get it out, you know. Um, you're able to handle all this stuff a whole lot better and you can solve a lot of the problems with doing that. But um, right now it's just, it's too big of an issue to really just be able to solve it all, all in this time period, even if everything has been shut down and that would be one of the better times to do it. Well, and I think that's true of all these issues. Like they're too big to tackle the whole thing, but that's part of this conversation is to think about what are some small ways that we can start to tackle them together as a community. This is the, I'm thinking of um, uh, this food system topic is one of what one of the ones I think is most interesting. I wonder if we should, um, I'm looking at the clock, we should talk also about um, maybe water quality is one of the ones that came up on Tuesday and air quality and climate change. Um, I also, Will and I talked a little bit about the dark sky work that's happening in Rappahannock County, which I think is interesting. Um, biodiversity. So does anybody have any other ideas or suggestions on, on some of the other um, environmental issues that have been affected by coronavirus, either in positive ways or negative ways? I think basically we want to be aware of improvements that have happened because of the virus, the pandemic and try to be alert to see to it that not all of the good changes go away when we go back to the normal. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that. One of the slides that I showed on Tuesday was, I'm not sure if you were on, the, on this call on Tuesday, but it was about this concept called ecological amnesia. And a, a great example of that is the salmon restoration in the Pacific Northwest, where if you have a child who grew up with a salmon run in the stream near his neighborhood or his house, and then the salmon are no longer there, um, then there's an emotional response to that and a motivation to try to figure out what behavioral changes or what systemic changes need to happen to get those salmon back in the streams where they belong. Whereas if that same child grew up with no salmon in the stream, then there's less of a connection and less of a motivation to try to, to, try to solve the reintroduction of salmon problem. And I think that there's some parallels between what's happening right now with the pandemic when people are seeing the Himalayas for the first time from North India. Um, or people are having breathing clean air in LA or Beijing um, and they see that it's possible. So potentially that could be a motivator for the kinds of changes that need to happen so that we can have these improved environmental conditions during a time of prosperity and wellness instead of during a time of this tragedy and crisis. Yes, so, so I'm hopeful about that. Yeah, so uh, Kimber Smith, who lives just close to the school, um, asks, what are some of the positive messages that we can share to encourage others to keep up the work? Well, I think um, for me, these um, stories of, uh, places where you do see wildlife where you hadn't seen wildlife before or where you do see clean water or clean air, I think they're really hopeful and I think um, they're, those are good ways, good ways to share them. Um, one thing our family is doing, we are riding our bikes um, more than we did um, before and we are driving less and we said that's something that we're going to try to do more of when this is over. So um, I think there are some, some like major systemic changes that have to do with um, uh, federal government decisions and state government decisions and the we 
can weigh in on those decisions um, through advocacy. And then there are the little things that we can do in our own lives and in our families and at school. Yeah, I know for me personally, a um, couple of things that I've noticed in these last 10 weeks is uh, I'm ashamed to admit that I, I do single, single use plastic a lot. I drink out. Of, I know I'm a terrible person, um, but it has changed. And I think mostly because I've seen piles of trash accumulating. Whereas before I was moving around so much, you know, there might've been a can here or a can there or a bottle here. Um, now it's all located on like my workspace. <laughs> so at the end of the day, I've got two or three, you know, bottles or cans of, uh, you know, empty, water bottles or cans so um we committed to never never buying that again and we have one of these i like seltzer water and we have one of these glass seltzer makers so we've just uh my family has committed to never never doing that again and it has to do with the waste that we're um witnessing in our in our tiny little space so that's been a positive thing that we've done as a family. I mean, then we'll end up saving money for it. Um, and the other thing that I've noticed is, you know, not, not going out um, and spending money on just various and sundry things is cutting down on certainly the, the stuff that I then throw away. <laughs> so just the consumer waste, um, yeah. the landfills, you know, so I think that, you know, the slower pace and, and more focused effort on what it is that we we're doing um, and getting rid of so much of the superfluous stuff has been um, a game changer for my family. Um, so we're committed to maintaining that, um, maintaining that pattern. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is Carrie Mullaney. Um, I would totally agree with that. Um, there, I, I felt like there was something talking about like on the micro level but there was something about those few weeks that once we went into quarantine um, there was a feeling of being in like survival mode and it was a little different than the normal it's like I mean we were busy as teachers but you know we had more time we were thinking and I, there's something about having more time I mean usually we're so rushed trying to do as much as we can you know accomplish things and for me, that often means um, just like like you're saying with the coffee, just like doing you know doing things quickly and and not having the time to be as sort of conservative, um, you know, just on a really personal level. Like you know, we had a certain number of toilet paper rolls, and so you know, yeah, I realized hey, I've been using way too much toilet paper all these years. <laughs> so, um, you know, that was just like one thing, but I feel like there were a lot of other things. And, the, you know, we did take time to plant a garden, which we've done in the past, but I don't know, it took on more meaning. Um, anyway, that's just my comment on that. It's just something about, um, you know, I think our society is in general, like just really rushed. <laughs> and um, I think that ends up producing a lot of waste in some ways. Yeah, that's great. Terry. And awareness of systems in general has really come out of this. I think um, just even people running businesses that weren't quite sure where their materials and supplies came from, you get it from somebody who gets it from somebody. And a lot of the uh, chains are pretty distant chains that, that you know, we don't necessarily have the time to source things locally all of the time, but um, when you're forced to do that, or even be conscious that there is this chain that spreads out further geographically than you might have realized, I think a lot of the systems um, have been exposed for better and for worse. Um, I think a good exposure is what we consider essential, essential workers, that trash collectors are essential workers, that the, the, um, the the fact that people that are essential are not necessarily in the most respected or revered jobs and that that's something to rethink how grateful you are for the grocery clerk to, that they're there that they're coming in for their you know less than fabulous wages and less than gratifying job but they are essential to us right now the ups person you're so grateful to see them i feel like i have these words of gratitude for people that i haven't um 
you know, I'm, I'm telling them, thank you for being here, you know, be well, things that I haven't said before and an emotional uh, gratitude that I think has been deserved all along and hasn't, um, and, and local farmers, you're so grateful that these people are near you doing, and, and the work that it takes to farm. I mean, when you do go back to planting a little plot and growing vegetables, it really rekindles your respect for what goes into keeping pests away and all the other um, really time consuming and knowledge filled um, efforts that, that we've been taking for granted when we can easily move through the world and buy things here and there. So nice, Nora, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Or things that I think Wakefield should do, we could, I know there's a trash clean, the road cleanup every, well, I don't know how often it happens, but I know there is one. And I think we could do like alternate between a road cleanup and planting trees somewhere that needs to be planted trees. That would be nice, yeah. That's a great idea, Will. Um, yeah, that's a wonderful idea. We'll, we'll make that happen, buddy. Great idea. Well, every time I go hiking, I like bring a trash bag because I see garbage everywhere and it's really disappointing. But and every time, like on Sunday, I went to the park with my parents um, for a picnic because we needed to get out of the house. And we would bring not only trash bags for our food, but just it's everywhere and it's quite, it's just sad to see. So I recommend that. <laughs> Yeah, every single little thing is great. And having a little bit of time to um, slow down and reflect on every every motion that we make now is uh, it's been a gift. You know, the silver lining in this horrible situation. Um, it's been nice to be able to reflect on the time that you're spending and how you're spending it. So great. Anybody else have something they want to add? Well, I would just put in the chat a um, possibility of reusable utensils in the lunchroom and metal straws, and if, if that might be feasible on a school-wide scale. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, it's a great idea. I don't think we use straws just uh, to address that very specifically, but I love the idea of the reusable or, or re um, recycled utensils. <laughs> something that's compostable or or maybe or maybe the metal metal uh, utensils would be a great idea is there a dishwasher in the kitchen there isn't no nope. that's an issue there's no way to wash the yeah regular utensils right now yeah so many kids could be encouraged to bring their own that's what i was Absolutely. thinking right right or we can get a little dishwasher i mean that's not such a burden right mm -hmm. they even have tabletop dishwashers they have all sorts of possibilities there but I think that's a great idea and not uh, not a hugely expensive idea but really effective and talk about cutting down on waste each demerit you have to wash 20 <laughs> <swim>. <laughs> yeah we're not using our labor effectively <laughs> uh, so will what do you think about I know that you don't usually buy the hot lunch at school but um, but you've seen it, yeah. And just talking about you know listening to your mom talk about food food waste and Michael Marciano talking about food waste. You know, there's a the the nice people who distribute our food um, at school. They give everybody a portion of you know the different offerings on a plate. Um, and I bet there's a lot of it that does go to waste. Maybe kids don't like tater tots or whatever the choice is. Do what? You, <laughs> do you think that we should um, let children choose, but knowing that they might not choose any vegetables? Or do you think it's a good idea to have a vegetable on the plate and uh, hopefully encourage them to eat their veggies? We do, like at Wakefield, we have like a thing where we get like pizza on Tuesday. That's really the only one I get, so I don't know the other ones. But maybe we could have like a menu of like 10 things. And no matter what you get, like I could order a hot dog, but you have to have a vegetable on your plate. And you can't get the same thing, I don't know, three times in a row. I see. 
I like that. Now, do you have to eat that vegetable on your plate? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. That's great. That's great. One of the, this is changing topic a little bit, Suzanne. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about since our conversation on Tuesday is the, because a lot of the cool examples from all over the world are, are really air quality, climate change examples. And for the first time in Virginia, the biggest source of climate change emissions is um, transportation. It has been a power production, and it, that's still a huge chunk of our pie chart. But um, what might be ways that Wakefield, as an institution, could reduce its contribution to air pollution and climate change? And uh, one thing Will, we're talk Will and I were talking about this morning would be um, that for the big trips, which hopefully will come back, the big international trip. Um, that students could, and the um, chaperones and faculty could offset their carbon emissions from the air travel from those trips. And a cool way to offset the carbon emissions is planting trees. So um, potentially Wakefield could partner with a group like Friends of the Rappahannock River who does tree plantings. They often do tree plantings along the river, which it does a, a huge amount to improve water quality. But then you know, there could be potentially a senior project or a class project or a club that calculate what the carbon emissions are from that air travel and then plant trees um, on a local farm along the river to offset the emissions from that. Another possible air quality or carbon idea would be for a handful of students to explore what would it take to get solar, to take Wakefield solar, to get solar panels to power the school. Um, I think there's a ton of learning opportunities with that. There was legislation that just passed in the 2020 Virginia General Assembly that makes it easier and more affordable for institutions, the local governments and schools to, um, to be off the grid or to be well, on the grid, but to generate their own power. There are fewer barriers to that than there have been. So that might be something that if some folks are in, interested in exploring, at least look at what it might cost and what the benefits might be to the school. We definitely are on that path. The board is uh, researching that right now. And oh, awesome. Ms. Z uh, wrote for a grant this past year. We didn't get it this year, but we'll keep forward. So we definitely have our eye on that, on, on, on that way to um, get off the grid and get solar. That's great news. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. These are great conversations to have. And um, I will tell you, for most of the students who are on with us this morning, um, they're almost all of them are part of the Wildlife Conservation Club, which is a very active club at, on Wakefield at Wakefield Country Day School. And we've partnered um, both with uh, SCBI right across the street and with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, and I saw Jeff Trandall had joined our conversation. He's the executive director there this morning, Kate. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we've got a, an active club that's um, looking for new members, obviously, and very invested in hearing all these different ideas um, and trying to implement them as a group you know it's easier to do it as a as a group than it is individually but um we would love some sixth grade members too i think i think sixth grade should be able to join and bring their ideas to the table definitely yeah yeah so great and one other thing i'd just like to um throw into the conversation kate because it's been wonderful all the ideas that you brought forward I especially um, focus on the get back, get back better than normal that you've uh, been talking about. And, and from my generation, uh, just in the time I've been alive, which is, you know, this 60 odd years, I saw the return of the pelican, but I was one of those who remembered it before DDT started killing everybody off. But when they returned to the coast of California, it was huge. And I can remember the emotional, um, you know, connection. 
and also the during just in my generation when I was young you couldn't swim in Lake Erie you couldn't swim in parts of of Lake Michigan because sewage was literally thrown into it that has changed in my lifetime and now they're pristine waters that um, that are 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 clear and just uh, within the last 20 years there was a paper mill that was dumping its refuse into Lake Michigan uh, right off of our beach so that periodically depending on the waves there the and they told us it's all natural it's just chopped up wood right with the but you know the foam that came with it and the Clorox and everything and we all together as neighbors got together lobbying and it took a long time but they came in put a pipe and now it's much farther out so that there's it's it's dissipated it's not perfect because they're still dumping but at least it is not coming up on the shores and it is being diluted and I also just think of how nature replenishes itself. Um, I was around and there when, um, when Mount St. Helens blew and you go there today and you hike and it's from the ashen shorn sides, it's now beautiful with, 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 the, with, with the vegetation coming back or the fire in, Yellow, in uh, Yellowstone that destroyed acres. And now you go back and it's just gorgeous and it almost comes back more beautiful mm. when it comes back and the wildflowers and so forth. So that that renewal can happen if we want it to happen and i think what is going to happen with everyone seeing the air quality seeing the himalayas seeing all that you showed us in those those um slides i think this generation will's generation will have the the desire to keep that make that the normal and not go back so i'm hoping that will be the what everyone wants yeah. those are wonderful those are wonderful examples um, Jeb and I joke that um, when we see bald eagles, we get so excited and like pull the car over and tell Willem, I got the bald eagle, look at the bald eagle. And they're ho hum, like, oh, another bald eagle. <laughs> <laughs> when we were growing up, it was you did not see bald eagles on the East Coast. You just that is, that is so true. The last time we went sailing, there were four eagles that literally just were zooming around us. And it was just like, oh, normal. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, Will, Will and Mac and I made a giant U-turn in the car on the way to school in the morning to look at bald eagles in the, oh. in the fields. I didn't realize it was ho-hum to them. I'm sorry. Or maybe it's not ho-hum. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple, there's a couple of uh, suggestions here on the chat. Um, one is for Will. It says, do you think students would be interested in helping to tend a garden of pumpkins and sunflowers to harvest for Oktoberfest? And then really connected to that is, could there be a vegetable garden, fruit trees, berry canes at the schools? If the students have a part in growing healthy food, aren't they more likely to eat it? So Will, what do you think about those ideas? I think that the Oktoberfest idea, I think students would help harvest the pumpkins and sunflowers for Oktoberfest. And for I like the idea of a vegetable garden and fruit trees, but for Oktoberfest, it's like a maybe how long would it take to harvest? Not super long. And the fruit cheese, it would be like every day somebody would tend it. And I'm not sure students would every day want to do that. But I think they're both really good ideas. Great, good. Well, I, th I mean, I love the idea of a school garden. Me um, too. I love, love, love the idea of a school garden. It is, I mean, it takes, somebody would have to um, leave that yeah. charge. And it is, well, you know what it's like to have a garden. Yes, ma'am. It is some work. But the lettuces and the asparagus and, I mean, all the good things that are coming off a little garden now are totally worth it. It's tricky. We would have to get some folks to help out over the summer because that's really when the bulk of of garden things come in all your all your uh, fruits and veggies come in but we could make it a community garden and you know people could come and choose what they wanted over the summer um and having like a that. pollinator garden would be good too because right now we do right. need to help the bees yeah i think that oh it looks like gwen um gwen had joined us earlier she actually received a scholarship last year to um, start a pollinator garden uh, on, on campus that she and I have been talking about this, this last several weeks oh, about super. her 
Yeah, so hopefully we'll put in some, you know, butterfly bush or whatever that some, uh, vegetation that draws pollinators um, in and around that senior garden. So that I'll get with it this week. But yeah, I think I think having a butterfly garden would be really fun. Just a huge yep. butterfly garden. But yeah, but I'm not sure. If there's a sorry. Go ahead, Kate. I was just going to mention, Z, that the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, the Virginia Working Landscapes, they have a ton of resources. Um, they would be a great partner. Maybe they already are on the, great. On the pollinator garden. I also think that students during recess, if they knew how to handle a net, would like to catch butterflies and look at them. Wow. <laughs> That's a great idea. There's a, what's the term for that, Will? Do you know? No, ma'am. There's a, there's a word for people who study butterflies, I think, specifically. I'm not sure. What I saw it? it on a movie. I saw it on a movie. Well, I'm the doctorist. Is that right? Oh. <laughs> we believed you. There's some Nandinas along, there's a bed uh, in between the sidewalk where the buses pull up and the building, and it's got a lot of Nandinas in it. And Nandinas apparently are not a good thing to have in the garden anymore because uh, there's cyanide in the berries that kill cedar wax wings and oh. some other birds. So although we all learn to love Nandinas, now we're learning that they're not the best thing. So if there's any um, you know, garden real estate that's being looked for, that's one spot that those might be changed to something else. I'm not sure how sunny a spot it is. It might not get enough sun for a pollinator garden. But you know, that's half of the hard work of starting a new garden is getting the soil ready for it and having a, a you know space that's prepared so that might be an easy change out if um if people were agreed that that was a good idea yeah i love it i think it's great well this is um great fodder for for continued thought and uh and it looks like we might have some ideas some real real ideas to put into place as we go back onto campus next week for um some outdoor sports activities yay and uh and look to our summer programs and then to the fall so i mean these are things that can take hold pretty quickly as far as the school goes but i think all of the contributions that folks made to um their own personal uh epiphanies are great and um i think it's positive to have us all talking about these things so thank you kate wofford and will wofford for organizing the talk and for leading the discussion we're very grateful to you both and thank you all for attending again today we do have a few um a few of these seminars still coming next week and i'll send you emails reminding you of the uh the times and topics um, and the links. On Tuesday and Thursday both, uh, Will, there's a cool, um, and Nora, Daniel might like this, there's a coding class. It's an intro to coding. Um, and it's being offered by an, uh, a friend of our chairman's nephew, who is, th this is what he does, is give coding classes to kids. Um, so it's, going to be really a lovely opportunity. And then um, late Tuesday morning, Nan Roberts is gonna give the history of the Scrabble School. And so that'll be fascinating. She's a wonderful speaker and she's also on our adjunct faculty. And then on Thursday at late morning, uh, the chairman of the board is going to talk about ways to make your spending work for you via um, credit card perks. So I'm looking forward to that because I am I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I've never focused on that aspect of using my credit card shamelessly. So uh, I'm going to learn something. I love this. So we'll look forward to seeing everybody next week. And thank you, Mrs. Wofford and thank you. Master Wofford for doing this. Thank you. I saved the chat. Those were great ideas in the chat. So I just saved those and I look forward to following up on some of those with y'all. Thank you for awesome. Talking. Thank you. And thanks, Will, for coming. You're welcome. Yes, thanks. thanks a lot. A lot of good things to think about. Thank you.